Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's bring this to order. We had a discussion here because, you know, there's, there's Spanish people and Catalans on the panel and British people, and the idea of when to start a session is a subject of some controversy. So I wanted to start exactly at 2 o'clock, and I'm afraid the uh, Spanish and Catalan speakers on wanted to start a little bit later, you know, sometime later. But we're ready to go now, I think. So those of you coming in now, there's plenty of seats near the front. It's inevitable that when the convener starts speaking, there is a rush of the door. Um, okay. Privacy has been declared dead so many times that it must have been, you know, it must be covered with bullet wounds now. But just like a zombie, it keeps coming back to life. It refuses to stay dead. And I think it's vital, especially in the context of the kind of utopian techno-futurism that we see in smart city conferences, that we do take a chance to step back and consider some of these other social issues which are vital if smart cities are going to be also cities of, so, of, of social and environmental justice. Privacy then is a key issue. And today we have four very exciting speakers who I'm delighted to welcome to the stage. First of all, and I'll introduce them all collectively before they speak, uh, Mr. Wismar Medina, who's from Microsoft. And he's a, a specialist in, in the cloud and works on dealing with local and regional government and their efforts to move to cloud computing. Secondly, we have uh, Gemma galdon Carvel, who's uh, both a, uh, an academic at the University of Barcelona, but also a consultant who runs her own consultancy, Etikas, out of Barcelona, involved in many different European, pan-European projects, in fact, global projects on privacy, smart cities, and surveillance. And then third, we have um, Yamo Eskelainen, who's from the forum Vivium in Helsinki, who's originally an architect but works on all kinds of open data and design solutions to smart city and other urban problems. And finally, Dr. Carmela Tron Troncoso, who has just been appointed as a faculty member of the IMDEA Software Institute in Madrid. So congratulations on that new appointment. Until recently, had been in security and privacy the Security and Privacy Technical Lead at the Galician R&D Center for Telecommunications. So four fantastic speakers. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes each, after which we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. So we'll have that discussion and question session at the end. So you join me now in welcoming our four speakers, and we'll ask Wisma to kick off. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? I only have 75 slides in 10 minutes. Is that okay? That was a joke, guys. I don't have 75 slides. Uh, so my name is Wismar Medina. I work in Microsoft in the Redmond office in, in Seattle, in our headquarters. And uh, I work in the government team that is part of our public sector organization. And my job is to uh, lead the strategy for local and regional governments worldwide. Um, so, you know, like David said, uh, privacy, I think I have the pleasure to come to events like this, talk to many of you, some of you uh, elected officials or CIOs or, or IT professionals. And I think privacy and, and also security, because I think both are very related, are probably the top three in the top three topics that I hear every day. Would you raise your hand? Do you agree with that? Yeah, perfect. So um, I, it's exciting to be here because I think uh, uh, from a Microsoft point of view, we have a very exciting story to tell, and, uh, and that's what I wanted to share with you today, is how we think about privacy, uh, given our role in the industry, and given our uh, solution, which I hope you had a chance to, uh, to see in the, in the exhibit today. Um, you know, fr from, from, from a citizen point of view, privacy is a tricky, is a tricky issue, because on one hand, um, I want government to protect me and keep me safe, and that's one of the challenges that you have. But on the other hand, you want to have a little bit of freedom of expression or a lot of freedom of expression. So privacy is, is that fine line between both. And I think that's why it's a key topic, especially given the, 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 the events of the last 18 months. So I think when you think about what are the key technologies that are making this a challenge bigger than ever these days, I think we all agree that cloud uh, uh, computing is really 
uh, one of the key drivers of privacy being a hot topic. And if you had an opportunity to walk through the exhibit, not only the Microsoft exhibit, but the exhibit in general, uh, you probably saw that uh, a great amount of the solutions that you saw are cloud-based. So cloud brings in a, a whole new set of challenges. However, having said that, uh, not only uh, cloud helps in terms of, of economies of scales and efficiencies and cost, but it also enables a lot of scenarios that were unheard of in the past, allowing you guys to engage in a different way with citizens, with academia, with other private corporations, and so on. And in addition to that, it enabled models, business models, ways of doing things that uh, today we didn't think, we, we, don't, we, we didn't know of because of, of, of having the computing power within our uh, local data center. So cloud enables all those, all those um, uh, scenarios. The key challenge is that with cloud, the perimeter of your data center uh, becomes bigger, therefore the exposure becomes larger. So let me ask you a question because I, I'm very curious about this. How many of you feel like you don't have full control of your private information on the internet, right? Absolutely, right? It, it's kind of scary when you go and log into your bank and it asks you for your social media credentials to go into your bank and then you see in your bank all the information brought up from social media. It, 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 it feels good because you don't have to enter your information, but at the same time, it, it, it's kind of scary. So even though the benefits are great, um, the concerns are, are there, right? And that 91%, it's about the same number of people who raise their hands now. 91% of consumers feel their information is out of their hand, out of control. So I think you've seen over the last 18 months, I would go back to November last year when Sony was attacked by hackers allegedly from North Korea. Do you remember that? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah? And, uh, and they used cloud to really hack and, 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 and intimidate and threaten freedom of expression from Sony. But at the same time, Microsoft partnering with Google also used cloud to make that uh, movie available uh, to consumers. So it's an interesting set of dynamics that this technology brings to uh, the industry. So I think at this point, I don't have to convince anyone that cloud computing is an enabler for a significant benefit for your cities and uh, your citizens, uh, but it represents a lot of challenges. So what I'd like to do is share a little bit about the, the Microsoft thinking in terms of privacy, especially around cloud. And I'd like to start with uh, the reason why we think the way we think. And I'd like to start by something that is very core to, the, to all of us who work at Microsoft, which is our, our mission. 40-year-old company with a very, very clear, ambitious, and, and optimistic mission, which is empower every person and every organization in the planet to achieve more with technology, cloud being one of them. Um, it's a very bold ambition, so when we define how we work, how we look at cloud, and how we think about privacy in the smart city, this is where we start. And we start by defining a set of values that we believe, no matter how much technology advances, we believe these values are timeless. And I cannot think of anybody putting them in a better way than our CEO, when he said, we will advance technology, but if we're going to empower every person in the planet, we need to protect every person in the planet. And there are some values that are core for that, to that, trust being one of them. I'm telling you the whole story because this is where I want to land. I want to land on how those values define our commitment to the cloud and privacy being one of them. So this, if, if I want you guys to take anything away from this session are these four commitments. This is, this is one player in the industry, we believe a quite large one, and this is how we think about cloud in terms of, of our commitment, privacy being at the top of it. I will. Uh, expand a little bit on, on, on this uh, in a second. By the way, the timer is not going. <laughs> so when you think about those four commitments, privacy, security, compliance, uh, yeah, is that again? Okay, good. 
privacy, security, compliance, and transparency. Think about those four commitments that we're making as a company to the industry, and think about the size of our cloud business. That is the big, bold bet. That's a huge investment that we are making in our industry to be able to back up those four commitments. So when you think about a million servers, when you think about cloud services available in 140 countries, uh, we take those commitments very seriously, as you can imagine. So let me go, uh, I, I want to, to spend a little time talking about privacy, which is the key, the key topic of, of today's session. And, and let me expand before I go into that a little bit on the four, on the four principles. When I think, or when we think about security, uh, this is all about making sure that your data is uh, confidential. The confidentiality of the data that you trust us with is, is preserved. The integrity, the availability of that data. And we have significant investments to make that possible. We announced a couple of days ago at the Government Cloud Forum, the US, our CEO announced a whole set of new investments that are being made uh, in, the, in, the, in the magnitude of about a billion dollar a year in terms of security. So some might say that we're not a security company, but a billion dollar investment in security is significant. I'll hit privacy in a second, but when we talk about compliance, what we mean with this and our commitment is that your content, doesn't matter what country you're in, your content will, uh, and, and your data, we will ensure that you are complying with local laws, regulations, standards that are relevant for you as, your, as our customers and the, as the safeguard uh, of, of your citizens' data. So we commit to that as well. And then last but no least, transparency. We want to make sure that you know what we're doing with that data. We want to make sure that you know who has access to that data. And we want to make sure that you do with that data whatever you want to do because that data belongs to you, not to Microsoft. Okay? So let me just talk a little bit about privacy and then I'll, I'll finish with this. We believe your cities, your citizens expect, number one, that the content is only be accessed as you wish. You define, your citizens, your uh, local government define how you want that content to be accessed. That's what we believe are, are your expectations. We also believe that you should always have access to your content and should be able to delete it or take with you or give access to anybody else you want to anytime you want. So those are the two key expectations that we um, uh, take into consideration when making our commitments to privacy. Now let me tell you what we're doing about it and how we are investing that, that money that I mentioned before. Number one, we have several data centers around the world and whenever we partner with a government, we let you decide where you want to keep the data. So you tell us in our data centers where that data should be stored. That's one of the things that we do in terms of, of privacy. Uh, we will not use your data for advertising purposes. We will not use your data to gain intelligence with machine learning to create new products. We won't touch that data unless you give us permission to, and we'll ask you if we want to do that. So that is a very, very important commitment. We will not disclose your information outside of Microsoft or except when it's uh, required by law. And we are very serious about that. So serious that if you follow the news, we've sued our own government three times to protect this right. So that tells you how serious we are in the United States I'm referring to about this commitment. So representing the, the, the safety and the, the, your rights as a customer uh, or your, the rights of your citizens is, is something that we also take uh, very seriously. We'll give you tools to allow uh, you to extract data in any way you want it. It's your data. And last but not least, if you want to remove your data from our data centers at any time, you can do so. And we automatically delete everything if we haven't, um, uh, uh, if, you, if you stop your service with us after 180 days. So just to give you an idea of how a company like, uh, like ours, who uh, we believe plays a significant role in the industry, given the magnitude of our business, uh, though, uh, uh, takes privacy into consideration within the context of the smart city. So I'd like to finish again with this because I think, again, it's a, it's a very positive uh, uh, core set of values where we believe we all love, and I think most people in this room love technology, and we believe technology is at the core of enabling 
smart cities. This is what we've seen in the exhibition uh, these days. We believe technology can enable and can drive economic growth, social inclusion, environmental sustainability, compliance. And if we don't trust technology, we will have a problem. So that's why we are so serious on these investments. So with that, I'll hand it over uh, to my colleagues, my information there, if you want to chat now or later follow up with an email. Thank you, everyone. So after hearing from Microsoft, a company that runs on data, to hearing from a company that runs on privacy, whose business model is privacy, and, and I assure you, there, there is a business model, and things are changing, and I think that um, Wismar's contribution is showing that there's more and more of a concern over privacy, and that privacy cannot continue to be overlooked. But let me, let me tell you a bit of a story, how we've seen working on, on, on the social impact and privacy impact of, se of different data intensive technologies, how we've seen the, the issue of, of smart cities um, evolve. So we started talking about smart cities probably in the late 20th century. Um, before we talked about sustainable cities, we needed a new buzzword. Um, books, articles began to be, um, to be published. And smart cities were supposed to be the new promise for a new urban paradigm. Smart cities were supposed to change everything. And the technological cap uh, capabilities were supposed to have a huge impact on how, not only on how cities are thought and designed, but also how cities are experienced. It was thought, the idea was that town halls and governments would not be able to resist the need to invest on technological solutions um, to, smart, to smart problems. However, sometimes has, sometime has passed, 15 years, and we We've seen how most of the solutions that have been presented under the smart city umbrella were actually not that new. And some of the ones that were new were not all that useful. So they, a new paradigm hasn't emerged yet. And if it is to emerge, I guess some things are going to have to start changing. So there was this promise, but then what happened? There was a financial crisis. And so the idea that governments were going to have the financial ability to massively invest in these new technical solutions for cities didn't, re didn't really become um, a reality. Also, the business promise behind many of the smart solutions failed to materialize. And the actual solutions failed to deliver a new paradigm. I tour the world looking at smart city solutions, and I've seen many success stories or promising stories, but I've also seen a lot of this. Uh, this is me putting the picture in the Barcelona Smart City brochure, advertising a smart lamp um, initiative in Barcelona against the actual street. The smart lamps have not worked for years. They were abandoned because the company that put them up failed to find the business model and they were just left there. And I see more and more cities becoming massive graveyards for smart devices that never made it out there, that failed to materialize, that failed to convince anyone that there was any value in them. It might be a matter of time, but I do think that it's, this is telling us something. The, the amount of abandoned initiatives that we find, especially in urban, in urban areas. But there's also been lots of smart failures. Um, the, ca the case of Sony was just mentioned, but there's a lot more, and it's not only Sony or Ashley Madison um, or the iCloud. It's also the Dutch citizens in 2005, when smart meters were beginning to be installed in, in EU homes, saying we do not want smart meters in our houses with a really powerful argument. Actually, consumers associations in the Netherlands used a range of different arguments to change the, the smart meter initiative in the Netherlands. But one of the very powerful arguments that they used is that's a, that's a drawing of the Anne House house <laughs> in, in Amsterdam, I guess. You're all familiar with, um, Anne Frank, with who Anne Frank was. Um, she, was, she survived for some months in the back of a house during the Second World War, but was later captured. She wrote a diary, and it's famous worldwide. One of the arguments that they used was that if smart meters had existed in the Second World War, Anne Frank would not have lasted one day. Because with smart meters, you cannot have 
um, dark spaces in your house. Everything is out in the open. You can't hide. And there are times when hiding can be legitimate. I think that it's such a powerful image and it says so much about how we need to think about the technological infrastructures that we are building in our cities. So this happened and the whole smart meter strategy in the Netherlands had to be changed. Opt out had to be included. The readings of the smart meters had to be um, taken with more time in between. Initially the, the monitoring was, um, was permanent. Another example, much more recent, the spy bins in London. The town hall in London authorized a private company to install these bins that were, were, did what bins do, which is they would allow you to put your trash in, but they also had sensors, like the sensors you've seen in the fair outside, that could capture the MAC address in your, in your phone, and the idea was that they would be able to see how people used public space and over time give them um, personalized advertising based on where they go, uh, where they come from, where they go, what shops they enter, their speed, etc. This was installed with no notice to citizens and so when the media picked up on it, a massive uproar, people started asking questions, the system had to be dismantled. At a huge cost financially for the company and for the town hall, but also at a cost of reputation. The city realized that the cost of this was not just financial. And it's interesting that we've worked with um, cities since then that have come to us to say, can you please help me avoid what happened to London with the spy bins? Can you please help me make more responsible choices when I, um, when I buy technology for public, for public spaces? Another example, which is, I think, quite relevant. This is very similar to the, um, to the London scheme in New York. This was, in this case, it was not bins, but telephone booths. A beacon-based system was installed, completely legal, not like the one in London. In this case, it was opt-in, and so you were, only part, you were only being tracked if you agreed to be tracked. So in this case, from a pri privacy perspective, we would not put forward any complaints. The reaction of the public was exactly the same, and the systems had to be removed. Citizens are getting more and more worried and angry at how their data is being used without their consent. There's a survey published just last week by the Pew Research Center that said that in the last year, 60% of the people they surveyed had not installed a mobile app after seeing the privacy permissions. 60%, that is market share, that matters. And it's not just uh, a small, fraction or a small corner of people. We're talking about 60% in a massive um, sample of, of people. So things are changing. And, and it, what is happening is that the calls to our trust need to be more and more backed by facts. We will trust, that's what we're hearing from citizens, we will trust companies that prove to us that they can be trusted. So saying I am safe saying I care about security, saying I care about privacy is not good anymore. Also because people don't really understand technology. So just like it happened in New York, if people feel that the technology is too invasive, even if it isn't, they'll say, I don't want, I don't want it. And so we're running a huge risk here with allowing bad practices to proliferate. And what we've seen is that all these things happening has translated for the smart city world in some sort of smart fatigue. And I think that the last, I've been coming to the um, to this fair for several years and talking to lots of stakeholders. I think that for the last couple of years, there was clearly a sense of smart fatigue of maybe this is not the way to go. Maybe this will never make it. Maybe there isn't a new paradigm. Maybe there isn't a new market here. I feel that this year things are beginning to change. There's like an effort in re-aliving, so, so to speak, putting new life into, into, into the term by putting more emphasis on citizens and not only at the margins, but, all, but all, uh, also as part of the, main, of the main discourse, talking a lot about bottom-up initiatives, not just corporations coming and saying what we need, but actually listening to small startups, um, what citizen are, citizens are, are developing from the ground up. But there's also more clarity on the business model. Uh, it's quite interesting that what the media in Spain has picked up about the last couple of days of having this, um, this event is that companies are beginning to say, well, we realize that cities may not have the money to pay for our solutions. What if we get paid in data? 
And so the business model is a lot more clear before. We have always known that when there's data involved, there's a, a secondary uh, business model. In this case, it's coming to the fore. It's like, well, maybe you'll never pay me in euros, but you can pay me by giving me unhindered access to the data of your, of your citizens. And what is interesting is that if that is the case, if data is what is being sold, if personal data is what is being sold, if personal data is what we're talking about, then how come there's so little on privacy and security? We just spend a long time going through all the stalls in the, in the fair. We only saw one reference to security, one, and none to privacy. So if we've learned anything from the last few years, we've learned anything from this promise failing to materialize, is that maybe we haven't been too smart at identifying what are the things that are, stop, that are, are stopping the smart city from becoming an actual new paradigm. How come we continue to talk about centralized systems when we know that those make us completely unsafe? We have the terrible um, experience of the attacks this week, but can you imagine what a hacking of a centralized smart system would mean for our societies? Why don't we talk about distributed systems? Why do we keep insisting on things that we know don't work? Why don't we talk about consent? How we ask permission uh, from citizens to use their data? How come we don't talk about accountability, about open source, about auditing of the systems? I'm very, I'd be very happy to believe the best intentions of Microsoft, but I would like to see it. I would like to make sure that what's in their mouth is also what is in their, in their systems. And oftentimes, I have no way of knowing that. I can only just trust them. And I would love to do that, but I need something, I, I need something more. I'd like to trust not on the basis of faith, but on the basis of, um, of fact. So in the end, my main, my main point is that this is what a smart city is. A smart city is a collection of sensors that track people's every move. In the street, in the supermarket, in public transport, at home, and at work. That's what the, the smart city actually is about. And if you go out, you'll see that we're only talking about sensors that gather the information of the people. So smart cities run on data. Smart cities, therefore, can and do spy on you. Sometimes that can be good, but you need to empower the people that you're spying on. They need to be able to control what is happening with that data. Not only because that's the good thing to do, also because that's the legal thing to do, because your systems will oftentimes be illegal and therefore will not sell unless you take that into, uh, into account. Also because there are acceptability issues. As I said before, there's more and more people that do not accept systems that take their data and their privacy for granted. So if you don't take that into account, again, that is market share. You will not sell your, your product. But also because there are alternatives. It doesn't have to be this way. There's a lot of talk of responsible innovation. That's how we call our products, responsible research and innovation. We, what we do in smart cities, we call it the responsible smart city. You don't have to call it that. Call it whatever you want but make sure that you use solutions that minimize how much you abuse people's data. Make sure that in your smart city paradigm, citizens and their data are at the center of the analysis and make sure that data works for the social problems we have diagnosed and not the other way around. Thank you. Okay, it, the not, technicians do it, we don't have to. Okay, so hi, I'm Jarmo from the city of Helsinki. I lead the uh, innovation arm of the city called Forum Virium Helsinki. Uh, I won't be talking about that, uh, but just as an example of what we've done, we have uh, been responsible for managing the open data initiatives of Helsinki since 2009 and turning that into a permanent operation and uh, Helsinki is now currently the uh, leader in open data in Europe, uh, so we have quite extensive experience about open data. And my topic will be uh, privacy in the context of my data. And my data is not the same as open data, but it's partly linked. So I will be uh, 
but it's important to understand that I won't be covering all privacy issues about open data. And within my data realm, there's stuff which is not open data. But as a clarification. So, and I give my regards to the people who are actually behind the work. I got a pre present which is Antti Poikola, Kai Kuikkanimen, and Harri Honko, researchers from uh, uh, Alto University and Open Alice Foundation Finland. So they are much more clever than me. So it's good to use somebody else's stuff when talking about such an issue. First, uh, who's heard about my data? Who knows the concept? A few people. Okay, I'll be opening that up. It starts with the fact that personal data is everywhere. Well, that's already clarified to you by the previous speakers. It's in energy systems, transport, mobility, web services. We distribute our personal, personal data all over the place because that's the way we get customized services, services you want to use. And the question is, how the hell to manage it? The uh, identity business is massive. So digital applications can bring a trillion euro to Europe in 2020 because personal data is an asset. It's sort of a new form of currency. We pay with it. There's no free lunch. If we pay for a free service, we pay without privacy. But it's, it is challenged. There's lots of potential which is not being realized. There's a murky region of who actually gets the benefits or even who actually gets the data. And of course, then what happens to me as a person within this transaction? Is it a conscious decision when I sell my privacy? Most cases, I claim it is not. We agree on something we don't know about. We don't really understand what we agree on. And the uh, fact is that if we fail in fixing this, we lose the market. So two thirds of potential value generation can be lost if we can't, if people don't trust what's done with the data. That's the same stuff as Gemma said. 60% uh, didn't download the apps. And 78% of customers say that they don't trust companies. They don't trust what companies do with the data. Of course, it's still different whether they trust and still use the service, because quite often, yes, that is the case. But nevertheless, they don't trust. And I think that the further we go in service platforms into areas of our life, which are not entertainment, when we have service platforms of well-being, healthcare, education, trust, then that will become an issue. And those service platforms probably will be coming because we have service platforms for most everything else already in our daily lives. So my data as a concept means a new approach to managing data. It's an open data approach to personal data. So that it's human centric. The person has right to data, right to control it individually, and right to privacy. It's usable, it's machine readable. My data doesn't mean that when I ring my operator now, I want to have my phone records, I will get this thick bunch of paper. It means that I can access it in a digital format. That's my data. It's transparent so that I do know what's being done with my data, where it goes, and I can decide about it. And it should be open so that privacy management can be detached from service provider. How are the current models? This is the API model, which we now have. I mean, it's a distributed model, but I'm not sure if that's safe either. That's, how, that's our digital realm at the moment, mostly. We use umpteen services where we copy-paste our passwords. Uh, some of them can be cracked through other services. And actually, we don't even know in how many services we are logged in. There are all these dead services with our information in them. We haven't used for ages, and still it's there. And the other system is the aggregator model. Microsoft is a potential aggregator. They can do it for us. And the fact is, this is probably more safe 
than the completely distributed model, which is managed by absent-minded individuals. But the problem there is that, first of all, it's not mine, actually. In reality, it's not still not mine. And they don't talk with each other. I have to buy in for one platform, and that's my life then. And of course, there are some issues with the uh, recent US security policies, which might undermine our trust in these big platform operators, which all come from the United States. That just has to be said out loud in Europe. There's, there wasn't much respect to privacy of US citizens, but much less to privacy of anyone else from anywhere else in the NSA actions. And it's still going on. So my data model means that we bring the person to the center, and that means a new way of integrating and managing data. And what that means in practice is that there should be or could be a my data operator, which we trust. It's not decided what kind of operators there are, but anyway, which we trust, who manages the data and companies we use access the data from the same source as we as individuals use it. And we can transfer the account from one operator to the other. It's transferable, account portability. And we should have standardized agreements about the use of data, not the lie, biggest lie ever model, which is the current way that I have read the terms, most people haven't, but to create a common kind of scalable model of privacy, that that company can use my data for this purpose and the other company can use for those purposes, and I decide. So it's a bit like changing to digitalization in other areas of our life, from uh, mainframes to personal computers, from calling a place to calling a person with a mobile phone, or traditional data warehousing guided by laws to me managing my data. The benefits, uh, this is sort of a basic model that there's a hub which could be, for example, maintained by My Data Alliance, what kind of organization that could be, don't know yet. And organizations have their My Data operators, we have ours, and they can connect through the hub. And then we can have multiple actors specializing in certain areas there, serving individuals, serving companies, refining data, managing data. And the promise is the benefits are for data owners or data sources, you can complement services with other services. You can exchange data with the individual. You can have scalable uh, models of permissions for your clients. So you get even the uh, suspicious ones as clients because they can select the lower level. And uh, that's potentially business and trust both. So what's there technically? Uh, well, it's a massive study we, and work we should be doing. I won't be going into these details there, but uh, both the analytics and transaction side needs lots of work to build this into actual functioning. Operator, we do have lots of components, but it's not ready yet. And it's linked to other phenomena, privacy, Regarding laws, probably we should be revising those. Cybersecurity, I mean, how do you trust the aggregator? How, how do you prevent the aggregator from be, being hacked? Customer management, relationship management, open data, some of that is my data or contains parts of my data. Big data, of course, if we can trust that data can be anonymized, it can give lots of opportunities for big data uh, systems. And uh, what should be happening next is a pilot-based approach for my data. Why pilots? Uh, because it all can't be solved at once. So the vision we have in the Nordic cluster of my data actors is to start in phase one, understanding how it works, sort of a clarity of what's needed through pilots S and in different domains. So at first we solve I, under each domain how data is managed, and then gradually we can go closer to the integration model where, for example, through an object approach, certain components of data management are shared between different uh, 
uh, rearms of the my data entity. I won't go into tech detail there. There's lots of stuff behind it, which people are already working on. Possible cases: uh, research data banks, anonymized data drawn from my data, so that we can be trust that it's anonymized. Loyalty cards combined. See, I can see the data on my loyalty cards. I can decide that, you know, destroy that. I don't use no service anymore. I mean, you don't have any access to it at the moment. Or European-wide insurance and pension uh, systems, which make the uh, way different benefits works much easier for us to understand and manage. Yes. And next steps. Uh, first of all, where should we do this? And to put it plant bluntly, I don't think this is the work for the US scene at the moment. At least not from the European perspective. Sorry to remind you again, but that's the case. But all the aggregators are actually US companies, so there must be collaboration. Then in Europe, there's better legislation, but it's totally splintered and scattered at the moment, and we don't have aggregators. So there's a platform issue. And I hope that we won't go to the China model. So from this viewpoint, the Europe would be the place. And uh, we would like to establish a My Data Alliance to work on this topic across European nations. Try to harmonize the single market for My Data in Europe. Which doesn't mean that all our data is in one place. But it does mean that we can manage it in transparent and understandable ways. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, and questions probably later. So is this on now? Is it okay? It's on? It's okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, pardon? Yeah. So uh, my talk is about, okay, can, so we have heard now the perspective of Microsoft, then Gemma saying everything's gonna be a nightmare, and then I want to give you the technical perspective of is a privacy preserving smart city an utopia that we will never gonna arrive or is it a reality, as, as Microsoft was saying, okay, we can enable a smart city with actually a lot of privacy on it? So the smart city, as, uh, uh, as Yama was saying, so we can, we have been walking here around the exhibition, and then we saw two type of actually uh, exhibited stuff. On the one hand were the sensors, all of these little sensors that we had here, and on the other hand were the companies that were doing analytics on this data, which we can call big or small data, that depends very much on the company. And actually what the, we see is that, okay, what everybody tells us is we have big data, we're gonna do some data processing and analytics on this data and we're gonna get value. And what is not that apparent in, in, in this exhibition, well, like for instance, one very good example is pollution. Right now in Madrid, we're having this problem where we have a lot of pollution, we have sensors everywhere, they are telling us that the level of pollution is going over the top and then the mayor can tell us, okay, now you cannot take the car out and we can bring the level back. So this is very great. But then many times what we actually have is the big personal data and the uh, data processing analyzing of big personal data. And this is about uh, finding our whereabouts, our relationships, and this, uh, while in the beginning may seem not that harmful, actually reveals our shopping habits, it can reveal the religion, depending on how much do you visit certain uh, religious places, uh, your favorite restaurants, which actually may, again, bring something about your religion, your country of origin, 
and the relationships, not only my friends, but also my professional relationships. Where do I go on my working hours? Which are the companies I visit? And also we have seen many research about uh, how, for instance, smart energy can reveal the habits at home to very, very fine-grained uh, inferences. So actually, when we have all of this, what we actually are building is a DNA of citizens based on their behavioral. It's not the same as my DNA. It doesn't seem as scary as the genetics, but it's actually something that is being called soft biometric and that people are starting using as a pseudo identity. So the question is, OK, if I now want this, and then we bring in what uh, Gemma was saying, like, OK, there are a lot of ethical issues. There is the public opinion hidden in. Uh, we have a legal framework, at least in Europe, that says that we have to uh, gather data with consent and the, only gather proportional data to what we want to do with it. And then we have some purpose limitations. Is the question is, OK, can I have, still have value and privacy? Are these smart cities feasible? So I want to speak today about two technological paths to reconcile this value and privacy. And one is data anonymization. We will see that it's non-trivial in this case. And the other one is the use of advanced cryptographic techniques, which are called processing in the encrypted domain. No worries, no formulas, no, no nothing. It's, it's going to be fine. It's going it's to be fine. So anonymization is about removing identities. And for very long, we have seen people, OK, we just remove the name or we just remove uh, some what we think are very clear identifiers and we're going to be fine. But in the latest years, we have seen many researchers saying again and again and again, this is not true because there is a lot of data out there and a lot of data to re-identify people. And the EU has taken this into account. And a couple of years ago, Article 29, which if you don't know, are the people in charge of doing the data protection legislation in Europe, issued this opinion on anonymization techniques, which kind of says, what has to be done for data to be actually anonymous and then considered not personal and then fine to process it. So the first one is that it should be not possible to single out individuals. And this is very hard because metadata tend to be unique. And in particular, if we have not only data, but big data, this huge amount of data. So the locations, for instance. We have seen research that says that the median size of individuals anonymity set, so the number of people that have the same characteristic with respect to location, uh, for just my home place and my workplace is one if we're looking at the block, 21 if you were looking at the track, which is a larger region in the US, and then uh, 34,000 if you're looking at a county. So only if you are at the, at the county size or larger, you actually have some kind of privacy. We also have some other research that says if we gather a lot of data, fine-grained data, which is some of the light that we would have in a smart city, like for instance with these uh, spy bins, then um, even if you just can track people, people are identified by just four spatiotemporal points. So our variety of how we move around the city is so different that just four points uniquely identify us. So if we really want to anonymize this data, we have to, to try to remove this, this information. The same we have for browsers. It has been demonstrated that uh, the browser, whenever you uh, surf a page, it not only tells it what page it wants, it also tells, hey, I'm talking to you from a MacBook, and this is my web browser, and this is the size of my screen, so that you get a very nice view of the website. But when we take all of these characteristics all together, it turns out that we are unique. So it doesn't matter if we're using uh, an anonymous browsing, it doesn't matter if we're using the Google safe mode, this is still a unique identifier for us and we can be tracked around the web. Uh, for demographics, we have that 87% of the US uh, have a unique zip, gender and date of birth. And if we think about it, this, this actually kind of makes sense. If you think about the people that live around you, there are not many people that have the same date of birth as you and also live in the same place and also are of the same gender. And later, uh, just beginning of this year, we had the credit card transaction study that just said that you just need four purchases or even less, uh, just three purchases, if, if you know the price, to identify people. That means that I'm the only person in the world that in my credit card transaction, I have these tickets for a football game plus a theater in Madrid plus this uh, fancy air cooler that I bought on Amazon. So that, that 
single mother dad is very difficult. Then the second thing that they say, okay, you should not be able to single on people because metadata is unique. So the second thing that you should try to avoid is to link, to take uh, anonymized data and start linking pieces of data from the same individual because then we can build this metadata and again you're going to be unique. But then we also have that this is very difficult, again because we are so unique, if we use other uh, background information it is kind of easy to start linking back pieces of data. For instance we have a very famous paper for the, for the next, uh, they won the Netflix prize, uh, Netflix is this uh, movie website from the US, and they just wanted to release data. So they uh, released a lot of data about the ratings of their users and say, okay, check if you can de-anonymize it. Then some guys from Texas went around and did anonymize it. And what they s said is that, okay, I don't need names, I don't need anything, just your social structure, who are your friends in Netflix, is gonna be the same as who are your friends in Facebook. So if we superpose one over the other, we're going to be able to identify people. And they improved this technique again in the Kaggle context, we have something very similar. And there was a lot of uh, common from in the academic community about this. And now we even have techniques to do this automatically. It's not that we have, uh, we learn algorithms for anonymization, we learn, no, we just have a way to automatically learn from two graphs who are the same people. And then the last one is that, okay, it should not be possible in this anonymized set to make inferences about individuals. But then we have many work that said from your location, we can infer the workplace. The workplace is very easy. It's the place where you are from the morning till the evening. The home place, which is where you sleep. Again, religion, uh, and there are many more examples. Then for energy, as I said, people can infer the concrete appliances like this fridge from LG or this fridge from this other company. We can have home habits. When do you take a shower? When do you use your dishwasher? All of this is just visible from a, from a smart energy reading. So then we're like, okay, the, this anonymization part seems impossible, which is kind of true. Full anonymity is not possible, but okay, there is this way of measuring the risk of the anonymization. And again, if we go for the responsible privacy that, that Gemma is speaking about, okay, we can, can try to play with this and then find a way of uh, uh, having a, a measure of the risk so that the citizen that give us the data know what risk he's falling in. And we can have some kind of responsible uh, operation over the data. And for this, I have to say that general anonymization in general is not possible. We just have to put so much noise on it that it's gonna become not useful for any analysis. But if we have an application in mind then we can do wonderful things that allow you to process this data without endangering the privacy of the citizens. And then the other avenue I promised to speak about is this processing in the encrypted domain, which uh, I'm gonna call some kind of magic. So the usual way that we use services, like for instance, location-based service, is I tell it, for instance, my GPS coordinates, and it will tell me where I am. How encrypted domain says is like, okay, I think about this, and then I produce a representation of it, an encrypted representation. Then the service provider with some operations give me another load of cramp, if you want to see it like this, and I'm going to be able to open this cramp to learn where I am. So the data is encrypted at the user side, but this provider, even though it cannot read, can process the data. So we have the best of all worlds. We have the service and the privacy. And sadly enough, we cannot do everything. Okay. Somebody that tells you you can do everything in the encrypted domain, nowadays it is not possible, but we can do many things. So we can do private searches in the database, like this location-based service. Uh, we can do private billing, in the sense that you can provide us pri uh, encrypted readings from your smart meter and we can compute uh, the final bill and actually check in that all of the billings are there, that the, all of the billings are compliant. Uh, we can do private comparisons, we can be, we can, which can become very useful, for instance, now that we are in this, uh, we need to check all of the passengers in flights. We could do this in the encrypted domain. Give me the encrypted name of a passenger, give me the encrypted list of passengers, and I can check whether this person is there or not without actually needing to breach the privacy of all of the other innocent people that are in these planes. We can do private sharing of data. Uh, we can do private statistic computation if they are needed for all of these smart city uh, type of applications about how many people go in this street, we can do this without the actual need uh, to just 
collect all the personal data of, uh, of every citizen. So whether this is at the end of the day an utopia or reality, well, if there's no personal data involved, of course this is a reality, but there are very few cases where smart cities are based on non-personal data. And if personal data, it is not yet warranted because we're still speaking about this world in which we give all the data to this aggregator and the aggregator is trusted, but there is a path. On the one hand, we have anonymization. On the other hand, we have advanced cryptography, and we can see this as support technologies for building a responsible smart city. So the path is there. We have the technologies, and we, as, as, said, as, as Gemma said, we should give a step back and start thinking, instead of just going so fast forward to build these technologies, can we actually do it in a privacy-preserving way? Because we have the tools. We just need to work together in order to get there. OK, we've got time to take questions and have discussions. So um, I don't know if one of the um, technical people can, take, can hand the mic out to people in the audience when they need it. It's there, good. You've got mics on both sides, on this side, sorry. Please go to the mic if you want to ask a question. Anybody wants to ask a question? If not, I will, I will ask a first question if there is. Yes, there is a question here, please. If you can sort of cue at the mics, then it's, it's easier to, yeah. Yes, <coughs> I was surprised by the presentation of the <coughs> person from Microsoft because you didn't uh, spend one uh, word about the case of the National Security Agency. When you referred about uh, worries of people, you just referred to the case of the attack to the Sony. Uh, and so, how can we have trust in a company that, uh, when referred to the situation about privacy issues, that just uh, keep silent about a scandal like that? Second, as was uh, mm, also um, made clear by all the other presentations, you presented the cloud system as a, as a wonderful uh, solution while there is a growing understanding and awareness included at the EU, at, uh, EU level that this is not the way, that the way is about uh, <coughs> going about in the direction of decentralization, distribution of the data center, and included uh, encryption of the, <coughs> of the communication. So I found your presentation uh, like uh, uh, um, an advertising, but uh, strongly manipulative in, yeah. in the content. Yeah. Thank you, can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Uh, so thank you for the question. I appreciate the, the candor. And, uh, and uh, that's exactly the kind of feedback that we want to hear. So let me, I, I will repeat the first one and I think I will repeat the second one and make sure that I capture it right. You said that how come I didn't mention anything about national security giving such the, the relevant event that we are witnessing in the world and how could you trust the company that doesn't bring that up as, in the forefront? Uh, so let me, let me give you a couple of, of thoughts on that. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't do that, absolutely. I, I, the focus of the presentation was more on the privacy side than the security side. But I, I couldn't agree more with you. So there, there is an overall theme that I think hopefully I was able to convey in my presentation that is about trust. We believe in Microsoft, we believe that trust has to be earned. We believe on that, it's, it's, it's a belief. And that's why we're making the investment. That's why I'm here on stage in front of all of you making very specific commitments that are backed up by contractual agreements, by lawsuits that we brought against the, uh, the US, uh, Supreme Court, by our actions in making public uh, uh, something that has been hacked. So let me tell you a little bit something uh, very at a high level in terms of security. We have, uh, two days ago we announced, our CEO announced the creation of the Enterprise Cyber Crime Unit, Cyber Crime Unit. In, in Redmond. We do have a cyber crime, a cyber crime unit already exists in a sixth and in, Red, in Redmond. And let me give you a little bit more details that I think some of you know. Um, when the unfortunate event of Charlie Hebdo back in, in January this year happened, we received in Redmond a request from, to, uh, from the FBI the morning after the attack to immediately release I, uh, some information, some data uh, that belong two of the suspected terrorists that carry out the unfortunate attacks. Uh, we 
validated that those requests were uh, valid according to international law, and we immediately released those requests to the French, to the FBI, and therefore the French police. And that drove some of the uh, actions that eventually uh, ended up by identifying this individual. So not only we take national security critically uh, uh, seriously, but we do believe that there is no security without cybersecurity. And that's why we're investing a billion dollars on, on this area. So I'll happily share with all of you, and I, I added in my presentation, specific links that tell you not only what we're doing in terms of investing in security, but we also even publish when we have this type of request from international um, uh, organizations and from our own government, when they ask us to reveal data because they suspect it's related to a national security threat, we even publish that. It's public, it's on our website. You can go and, and check it out. So with all due respect, I do, I do believe that we do a lot in, term, uh, in the favor of the industry in terms of, of security. The second, the second question, I, I, I believe it was more around, um, it was more about around the technologies that we're using in terms of uh, uh, security. Uh, am I right? It's about the cloud system. Cloud. Yeah. And yeah. The opposite, uh, with the absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So, um, we believe cloud is an enabler. We believe cloud is an enabler. We believe that the data center in the past was within our control, right? And all of you who work in government, your CIO manage and control the security of your systems inside their, their facilities. When you think about cloud, what cloud enables, not only is it just gains in terms of economies of scale, but it enables a lot of business models and things that were not possible today. Just walk around the exhibit and you will see that a lot of the solutions that are being shown are based on cloud computing. Right? So we, we do believe cloud is here to enable a lot of what's possible in the cloud, and I mean in the smart city today. We, we do have a big conviction on, the, on, on that, and, the, and we, we see it all the time. So that's why I, I, when I thought about this session, I wanted to make sure that you understand or that you heard from me that Cloud computing for us is critical in enabling the smart city, and with that comes some challenges in privacy, which is what I, what I focus on. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll one last comment. Um, guys, I, I, again, I'm coming here to acknowledge that trust is key for this to work. Trust in technology, we believe it is going to be critical for us to enable the solution that you saw out there. And that's why we're making this commitment. That's why we're saying these are our principles in terms of how we trust technology. Beyond cloud, forget about cloud. We are saying that we are committing resources, money, with very specific fact that we put in our contracts okay. to protect um, uh, the privacy, the security, the transparency, and the okay. compliance of Probably, our data centers. Yeah, first yeah. of all, thank you. We're going to have to move on because otherwise we won't have time for anything else. But Carmelo, you have a, you. a comment. Uh, so I would like to reply on the trust issue. So you're putting trust as the main way to get privacy. But actually, w what I'm hearing all the time is trust me with your data, I will take your good care of it. And as I understood the comment here, actually the comment is, should we trust the cloud? Can we trust the cloud? Is this model of, hey, trust me, I will do no harm, what we want to follow when we're speaking about the smart city, about gathering the data of millions of millions of citizens? And I think that the, the other a position here in the panel was, well, maybe we need to put more technology and technology that uh, supports this trust, and not only contractual, but just give me means, and, and what Yama say, give me proof, or give me some feeling that actually by giving my data, I have uh, some grounds to get trust other than trust me. Yeah, one quick okay. comment, David, and I think, I think that's a good point. One last comment. Um, one thing that we also have as part of our cloud story, our trust in technology story is choice. So I'm bringing cloud because I believe maybe I made a mistake assuming that it was the, more, the most relevant, uh, based on what I hear from customer, the most relevant technology that, that, that you guys are hearing about and it's part of the priorities of many of the CIOs in cities. But remember, we also have an approach where we can allow you to choose if you want to keep your data on premises in the cloud 
or in a hybrid environment, you can do that today. You can do that, and by the way, I'm, obviously I'm representing Microsoft here, but you can do that today, and there are ways to ensure that that's possible. Okay. Right? Thank you very much. I think we should move on to another question, and then we can have a chance for other p panel members to say more as well, so please. <coughs> Oh, hi there, uh, Sasha Meckler from Analysis Mason. Um, I, I just, um, uh, following on from the, from the last presenter's um, uh, presentation relating to the correlation of different um, supposedly anonymized or other data streams and allowing to allow for personal identification, have we moved out of the realm where data protection legislation is now sufficient, where we need to move into a world of privacy legislation protection? So where the requirement is incumbent upon the application developers, the service providers, not to make use of multiple streams of data to, without our consent, identify us. Because actually data protection, to some degree, is, is now maybe becoming irrelevant. Thank you. I could have said that, and then my presentation would be too, maybe too provocative, but yes. Like, like that's my argument. Right now, we're moving to a place where data protection is to be irrelevant. That's why the European Union, we also realized that maybe their uh, regulation was too soft with respect to privacy, is now starting to put these more strict requirements of what anonymization means. And the new data protection regulation, we, which we would love that it said more privacy and less data protection, is moving a little bit more towards data protection, but it still has many safeguards where we will see this coming more and more about you're processing personal data all the time, and hence you need consent and you need purpose limitation. And these technologies are going to become the enabler for many business that otherwise would be impossible to follow given data protection. Mm -hmm. I'll be very critical with data protection the day the data protection principles are actually implemented. But as long as we're in the world where data protection principles, which are mandatory, they're in the laws in our, all our countries, are ignored as they are at the moment, I think that the first move we need to make is defend those principles and then go beyond them. But we're in a situation, we did a study last year on compliance with access rights. Access rights are guaranteed in, in the whole of the European Union. They're very basic rights. You have a right when you provide your data to someone, to an organization, to ask them, what do you have on me? And they have the obligation to get back to you within a month, and it should not cost you anything. Just that, just tell me what you have on me. I'm not asking you to remove it. This is not the right to be forgotten. It's very simple. I've given you my data. I wanna know what you have on me. You can ask this to your, to your hospital, to your town hall, to your telephone company, to your electrical company. You, it's a right that you have, and it's, and it's a very guaranteed right. It's like the, base, the most basic right in data protection. Totally guaranteed. It's been developed in all countries. We found that non-compliance with access rights was 60% in the private sector and 70% in the public sector. So most actors don't even get back to you when you do something as simple and as legal as saying, can you please tell me what information on me do you have? So are access rights amazing? No. Should we start thinking about what is beyond access rights? Yes. But I'd say let's start by complying with those very basic things, and then we're gonna, we'd, be able, we'd be in a better position to think about what the next step would be. I think there's still a lot of potential in existing regulation that it's just not being um, respected by the players in the field. Yama, do you want to have a final comment? Because I think Zero's flashing at us right now, so we've got time for a final 30 seconds from Yama. The, uh, I couldn't agree more with, more with the access, but actually the, one of the reasons why it's so lousy is the fact that we are, don't have the mechanisms to do it in a way which is, which, which is not horrendously cumbersome for both the users and the service providers. And that's sort of a, that's a reason why we are moving ahead with the my data thing, that it should be more manageable to work with your data and to manage, manage your, your data. I mean, yes, we can ask for all our data from any company and they will send us this 10 kilos of paper. And Just that's not usable. One thing. Yes, but at the end of the day, you're also asking for trust. And I say yes to trust if you give me accountability. And I didn't see anything in your presentation that points to accountability on how, or how we'd be able to audit your aggregator. 
Okay, thank you very much to all the panelists. It is, it is there. We are going to have to end now because we're having zeros flashing all over the place and anxious people. So thank you very much to all the panelists again. And I'm sure that all the panelists will be happy to talk with you afterwards if you wish to kind of ask them further questions personally. Thank you, everyone.